Hello and welcome. I'm Carl Gerth, a professor of modern Chinese history here at UC San Diego, and I'm today's moderator. It's my honor to introduce today's speaker, Professor Ho Fong Hong of Johns Hopkins University. Before I introduce him, I'd like to thank the 21st Century China Center for hosting this event, the Institute for Arts and Humanities for co-sponsoring it, and of course, thank you all for attending today. If you enjoy today's event, please consider joining us next Wednesday, the 16th at 1 p.m. My colleague, Michael Davidson, will be moderating, it, moderating a discussion with our guest, Yan Zhong Huang, from the Council on Foreign Relations. They will discuss Dr. Huang's new book, Toxic Politics, China's Env Environmental Health Crisis and its Challenge to the Chinese State. Our format today is that Professor Hong will speak for a bit over 30 minutes. Then I'll begin the conversation with a few questions. Finally, we'll save the end of our hour for your questions, which I will moderate. Please post your questions in my Q&A, which I will try to group and then paraphrase. If all goes to plan, we'll be done in an hour. Now to introduce Professor Hong, who is the Weizenfeld Professor of Political Economy and Chair of the Department of Sociology at Johns Hopkins University. His research interests are wide ranging. Best of all, his research is historically grounded. His first book, Protest with Chinese Characteristics, Demonstrations, Riots, and Petitions in the Mid-Qing Dynasty, examines a thousand instances of protest in China from the 18th to the early 19th centuries and uncovers the evolution of Chinese dissent. His latest book sounds exclusively, exclusively contemporary, The China Boom, Why China Will Not Rule the World. But here again, he contextualizes his analysis on the long-term economic development of China. Today, we have asked him to speak on his latest research on how, in his view, the Sino-US rivalry is better understood as an intercapitalist rivalry than a clash between authoritarianism and liberal democracy. Professor Hong, please take it from here. Yeah, thanks, Carl, and thanks, UCSD, uh, for inviting me to, uh, to share my uh, latest research. On this topic, let me try to share screen. I have a PowerPoint. Um, here it is. And actually, it is. It is. Uh, the, this title is also the working title of my new book. And right now, I'm finishing two books that uh, um, running with time to 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 finish it and submit to the publisher to meet the deadline. And this is one of the one of the book that I'm supposed to submit the final manuscript to uh, to the publisher in in uh, late spring 2021. And I have another book also. Uh, working on about uh, finance and uh, geopolitics and protests in Hong Kong that uh, the deadline is like December 31st. So I'm like uh, in the final uh, stress to, to finish that one. Uh, so any uh, critique and, and comments will be very welcome. It is a research that I have been working on. And also I published some of the findings in the form of journal articles. So uh, any comments and critiques is very anticipated. Uh, so will help me uh, uh, revise and, and formulate the thoughts. And this, this of course, that for obvious reason, we hear a lot about this little cold war lately about the US-China relation and, and deterioration of the relation and a lot of speculation about what the Biden administration will be like uh, after the Trump administration. So my, uh, the, my take on the issue is that uh, this little cold war uh, talk uh, is, um, uh, had some insight in it, but actually this mostly misplaced it uh, because the little cold war, it, it make people easy to understand what is going on and, and uh, uh, create a kind of a sim simple or sometimes simplistic picture about US-China differences and which emphasize on ideological and political differences. Uh, the competition, the talk about the competition between the liberal democratic capitalism and authoritarian capitalism, they, they are the differences, no doubt about it. That, that, uh, but whether it is this difference in ideology and in the nature of the political system that drive the, the reason rivalry uh, actually, and also I, I, you will see that in my uh, talk later on that uh, this rivalry I trace back to its origin to around 2010, uh, actually in the, uh, uh, in the Obama second term rather than in the Trump uh, administration that of course Trump uh, take a turn uh, and raise it to a new level. Uh, and more importantly that uh, he make more people aware of this uh, uh, rivalry uh, by treating and by all these kind of exaggerated languages and, and dramatic uh, gesture and languages, 
Uh, but actually, if, if you look at the, the subtlety of uh, policies and, and, and relations and back and forth between US and China, the, the deterioration or the turn from harmony to, to more of the amity, uh, more of the contentious relation actually really started uh, around 2010 and uh, particularly in the Obama second term. Um, and uh, if we want to explain why and how this relation take a turn for the worse, that this ideological difference and political system difference uh, is not sufficient because um, these differences have been around uh, ever since uh, at least the 1990s, after the 1989. Uh, and, uh, uh, and if you talk about China aggressiveness in, in all other geographical areas like the South China Sea, you look, actually look at the conflicts surrounding South China Sea uh, between China and its labor, many of which are US uh, allies. Uh, actually, the surge started in in, in 1990s, and in the in the 2000s, it uh, raised to a new level. But uh, the sudden rise in this kind of a geopolitical conflict over South China Sea actually started in 1990s. So you need to ask if this kind of a uh, U.S.-China deteriorating relation is driven by this uh, China aggressiveness in geopolitics and difference in political system and ideology between the two countries. That you need to ask why it didn't come earlier. Uh, but came later in 2010. So it's that obviously not the uh, only unique or sufficient condition for this US-China rivalry. There must be something else going on. And more so that this is my favorite cartoon, actually. It uh, is a New York Times cartoon in 2009 that came uh, with an op-ed article by Neil Ferguson uh, uh, on the Trimerica. Chim so in, in, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, actually that uh, Neil Ferguson talked about Trimerica, or at that time there's another equivalent terms that is actually preferred by, by many Chinese scholars and Chinese officials. Uh, uh, that is the, the, the G2, that is uh, the talk that the G10, G9, G7, G20, doesn't matter. And, then, and, and uh, what matter in global governance, G2, US and China. Um, uh, at that time, even, even a, a Chinese very high rank official scholar told me in private that uh, around 2004, 2005, and he told me that actually now it is a world of uh, uh, a world governed by two gongs. One is Gong Chandang, Communist Party, the other is Gong Hodang, uh, the Republican Party. So it is, uh, he halfly, like jokingly, half jokingly told me that, that actually it is the, the Gong Chandang and Gong Hodang that, that, that rule the world, that is the role of, uh, uh, it is the era of George W. Bush, definitely. So this conception that China and US is in kind of not only harmonious relation, but in collaboration, in co-governing the world uh, is very prominent uh, in, in 2000s, 2004, 2005. I think the Neil Ferguson articles uh, that he co-offered with an economist uh, published in a in an academic journal is published in 2004, I believe, and then and then this op ed cartoon that came with his article is came in 2009. So at that time, really, the, nobody expect any trouble in U.S. China relation. That people only complain that China and U.S. Uh, has come too close. Uh, and and you look back, um, the, the, the even the economic system, the, the difference in economic system between U.S. and China or the China. Um, uh, so-called status turn that now many people blame Xi Jinping for that. But uh, actually, if you look uh, closer, and actually I have a grad student working on an excellent paper on, on this tracing uh, the origins of this uh, China status turn that you can actually look at uh, the turn um, uh, from the perspective that actually started much earlier in the Hu Jintu era, uh, in, in, in right after China uh, accession to the WTO. So, so if you take all this kind of uh, the recent explanation about why China and US get so uh, badly in terms of their relation, that, that this explanation couldn't hold uh, if you carefully compare the timeline of uh, this relation, how and when it turned from uh, harmony to, to, to the more deteriorated, more rival uh, uh, relation. Um, so I have I have a lot of slides that I'm going to skip. I don't have enough time for the, to, to squeeze it in, in 30 minutes, but uh, I would be happy to talk more uh, when you're interested uh, uh, and people ask questions related to different aspects of the issues in the Q&A. Um, so first of all, right after the, uh, the, right after the end of the first Cold War, so-called the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, actually, uh, people forgot about the fact that in the early 1990s, uh, the, the Chinese economic model is not fully in shape. 
Uh, and actually, after the Deng Xiaoping's uh, two in 1992, um, now, of course, people say that, oh, it's a great tour, it rejuvenate uh, Chinese economy, and we start reform. But actually, in the immediate aftermath of Deng Xiaoping's southern tour, China plunged in the economic crisis, and nobody wanted to blame Deng Xiaoping for that, but it is partly the southern tour that created a kind of investment, um, investment boom uh, that created all the problem. So you look at the 2019, uh, 1992 and 93 in the aftermath of the Deng Xiaoping Southern Tour, China invasion uh, hit a little high again and close to 25% in, in uh, 1994, but it stood up right after um, the, 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 the Southern Tour. And also the foreign exchange resolve in China also uh, uh, dissipated uh, because at that time, uh, China is not yet very, not yet very export oriented. Uh, so the investment boom triggered by the Southern Tour in, uh, triggered a lot of kind of uh, 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 capital import uh, of machines, of, of raw materials and things like that. And China didn't have a lot to export at the time. So at that time, China actually has a balance of payment crisis that uh, is running deficits. And also the, uh, um, uh, the, the foreign exchange reserve is dissipating. So it is in bad shape in 92 and 93. Uh, so in 1993, uh, Zhu Rongji, which was at that time this vice premier, uh, not yet the premier, the premier is still Li Peng, but uh, everybody know that. And, and as uh, Deng Xiaoping tell, told everybody that actually it is Zhu Rongji who's, who know the economies and he should be running the economy. And he's actually already running the economy, to making all the important decisions. So in late 1993, he uh, called in um, uh, all the, the rural cadres of the Communist Party to have a meeting in October and make a speech. At that time, the speech is internal. It's kind of secret speech that we didn't know about it, uh, the details about it. But after he retired, the uh, Chinese uh, government published a collection of his speech and, and, and his speech was, was made known uh, now, uh, years after his retirement. And in the speech, he's actually talked about uh, that, um, the dire situation of the economy. And then 1993 is a time when the Soviet Union just collapsed. So the Communist Party is really worried about the economy and think that the economy, uh, uh, might, might get to a um, uh, dive, deep dive, and it will uh, threaten the legitimacy of the party. So Zhu Rongji did, came to the rescue and, and, and tell people in the conference that you don't need to worry because I just met with the boss of uh, Morgan Stanley. Uh, they have confidence in China. They're going to support China, respond, reform, and they're going to pour money into it. More importantly, uh, he said that uh, now our foreign exchange reserve is uh, falling and it is very bad. Um, and so we have to boost our export to turn to export oriented mode of uh, development. Remember that in the 1980s, the Chinese reform is mostly about uh, agricultural uh, productivity growth and township and village enterprise growth. And it is a more domestic oriented growth that, uh, and a lot of rural service lab labor um, was, um, uh, you might call trapped it, but actually it's utilized and, and employed in the township and village enterprise. So in 1993, Zhuangji make a decision and saying that uh, it need to stop uh, and, and to free up the resources and, and labor uh, to the export industries. Uh, so uh, after 1993, 94, starting and onward that uh, the government investment in agriculture and the support of township and village enterprise declined and, and it is the beginning of the migrant labor. Then, then a lot of rural, rural service labor used to be absorbed in the TVEs were released uh, and they moved a long distance to Dongguan, to Shenzhen, to later on to, uh, to the uh, uh, Yangji Delta as well to, to work in all these uh, export processing zones. Uh, and about the same time in January 1994, there was the renminbi um, reform, the currency reform that actually is a massive devaluation of the renminbi to boost export. So all these policy came together uh, showing that because of the, the foreign exchange reserve uh, the decline and the balance of payment crisis in 92, 93, and also the inflation and all the problem and the debt problem of the state enterprise, Zhuangji really took a turn, uh, took the economy to a different uh, mode to push the export oriented mode of development uh, in 1994. Uh, so this, this, this argument, this is, uh, I have made it in my previous book, The China Boom, and interestingly that went, uh, when the state-owned press did it, translate my book uh, into simplified Chinese, and 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 I have a long story to tell, but but it is for another talk. That uh, they have done a good job in translating the book, except that whenever I talk about capitalism in China or Chinese capitalism, uh, they systematically turn it into 
uh, market socialism with Chinese characteristics. So uh, it seems that it is politically incorrect to talk about capitalism in China. We have to talk about market socialism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, and I have a recently a short piece that is just published in the Social Economic Review to talk about the meaning of uh, the, the, the Chinese government still don't recognize the system as capitalist. What, what is the meaning of it? Uh, but, but we might uh, want to get uh, back to it later in the talk or, or in the Q&A. But anyway, that is the, the argument I make in, in, in my previous work. But uh, more importantly, on the US side that I have recently published an article uh, is, uh, is in the online first version in the review of uh, international political economy talking about we visit the early Clinton uh, China policy. So when, when Clinton got elected and became the, the president since um, 1993, which is about the same time when China won to move to export oriented growth. So at that time, in the first year of Clinton administration, it really looked like that the Liu Cold War is beginning. Uh, if you remember that uh, in the first year of Clinton, the foreign policy and the China policy is run by the Winston North and, and, and uh, the foreign policy team also include uh, 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 Madeleine Albright and Christopher Warren. And they, they are the people who really are idealists who want to, to, to promote human rights and democracy and, and Soviet Union is just collapse and then South Africa is democratizing. There's a, all this talk about the democratization of the whole world. So they, they, they are really uh, pro human rights in China as a kind of a defining um, kind of a, a, a tone in the US-China relation. And also because Clinton came in win the election by strong labor support. And then at that time, organized labor is really, really uh, against uh, free trade, particularly opening uh, the little country for free trade. Uh, so the Clinton, uh, the first year in 1993, um, the policy is to uh, link the human right consideration to China's goods, uh, the low tariff access to US market. So it is the famous uh, human right conditionality for most favored uh, nation status of China. Uh, so that uh, annually they, they, they press to, to reveal China's human rights progress. If the human rights is not progressing that much, then they will, they will just stop Chinese goods from accessing US market in, in low tariff. And at that time uh, in 1993, when Clinton uh, rolled out this policy that the business sector is in the US, uh, some of them already have some business in China, but not much and really don't care much. Uh, actually, my article is based on the, the research on the, the US uh, business lobbying on behalf of China. So in 1993, that nobody much uh, quite care about these things. And so lo not many uh, US corporations are lobbying um, on behalf of China against this human rights conditionality of, of trade with China. Uh, because at that time, uh, laughter is uh, coming into being and actually uh, look back in the reports and then trade journals and all this uh, discussion that the, the corporate sector in the US is really looking at uh, Mexico and uh, uh, as a new frontier of globalization and and source of ship labor and they look forward to expanding laughter to cover the whole South America. So China is too, too distant for them and, and it is not quite uh, uh, in the radar or at, at least not in the centrality of the radar. So there's not much uh, business lobbying against this human rights conditionality until actually that um, um, China, uh, the Chinese government took the initiative actually to mobilize the US cooperation um, and, and I look at the, the People's Daily uh, the recording of all this kind of a business cooperation to visit to China under the invitation from the Chinese government that it's uh, actually it's, uh, jumped up in nine, late 1993 and early 1994. And I look at the content uh, of this visit and also the Chinese official visiting US cooperation when they are making US visit also increased at the same time. And I look at the content, they're mostly about persuading this uh, uh, business to support China's uh, most revelation to uh, unconditionality, that is to take away the human right condition for Chinese uh, uh, goods, low tariff uh, access to US market. Uh, and, and it's more importantly that uh, the cooperation targeted by the Chinese government to do this lobby, a lot necessarily some, it's not necessarily the cooperation that is directly related to trade. There's a lot of energy company, uh, aerospace industry, and most importantly, that AT&T, that will come back later, that uh, actually AT&T is one of the most active uh, player in lobbying uh, uh, to take away the human right condition for Chinese, uh, uh, the most favored uh, conditionality for Chinese most favored nation status. Uh, 
Uh, so this is this kind of a Chinese government took the, in this, took the initiative to lobby and, and influence uh, U.S. corporation to lobby on China behalf to take away the human rights condition. And it did pay off. And in the famous reversal in 1994 that Clinton in 1994 declared that uh, uh, human rights no longer a consideration in renewing China's MFN status. Uh, and, and, and of course, there's more details in, 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 in it that involve the power struggle between Wall Street and the State Department in the first year of Clinton. Then I document in my article that uh, the Wall Street uh, view represented by Robert Rubin, who is the head of the, the newly formed um, the Council of uh, uh, National Economic Councils uh, uh, in the Clinton administration. And then he actually openly trade fire with Winston Law about his human rights conditionality. And Nancy Pelosi and Winston Law and many State Department officials are saying that we, we, we are staying on course. We are not going to take away the human rights condition. And then, and then Robert Rubin uh, basically at the time uh, go all public uh, to attack this policy. And in the end, that, that the Wall Street won the battle, of course, and also uh, China won the battle uh, by mobilizing a lot of influential uh, corporations uh, to lobby for taking away this human right conditionality. So the rest is history that in the 1990s, um, the, the, and, and the, that a lot of corporations start to invest in China, definitely. For example, uh, AT&T, uh, now AT&T presence in China is minimal. Uh, but back in 1990s, there's really a lot of expectation that AT&T is going to go to China and take over the telecommunication business in China. Uh, and it is what China promised AT&T uh, when uh, it is influenced, trying to influence AT&T to lobby on China's behalf uh, to, uh, to take out the human rights conditionality and, and uh, with the expectation that uh, if, uh, if we lobby for this uh, MFN thing, then the China telecommunication market will be us. Uh, so so at and is one of the most active uh, corporations and most influential corporation in, in making this uh, happen. And some aerospace industry and, 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 and some uh, energy enterprise like Exxon Mobil and, and Amoco. And, and uh, at, the, at that time that China actually offered some drilling rights and, and uh, 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 to this company in to the oil field in, in South China Sea and in Inner Mongolia, then in exchange for their cooperation in, in the in the MFN lobby. So there's a lot of this kind of thing going on. And then uh, in the 1990s, uh, after the US-China free trade became a reality, then then a lot of uh, companies start to move to China and, and outsourcing the, the, the story that we are very familiar with. And then it led to a kind of a um, very amicable US-China relation that you look at the pattern in the 1990s that there has been in the military foreign policy and intelligence community, you look at look back at that period, there's a lot of uh, complaint already about, for example, China's aggressiveness in South China Sea and, and espionage and all kinds of issues. But these kind of things never turn into for example, bill in Congress that uh, take, really take care of it because the pattern is that whenever there is some from bill being floated in Congress to, to take care of these issues that people complain about on geopolitical and, and national security ground, it's always this corporation that is lobbying on behalf of China to kill those bills and never go to anywhere. Uh, uh, so, so it is the, the situation of the 1990s and it continue of course into 2000 and more so in 2000 after China got in the WTO and Many American corporations try to get a slice of this pie of the China boom. Um, so I don't have time to get into these details. Um, and at the same time, of course, that, that, that uh, uh, there's a, a huge uh, conception that uh, uh, US, while US is busy in all the other places in the world, that uh, China can be a, a, a team player and cooperative team player to help US to take care of national security issues. and. In, in, in Asia Pacific, particularly the North Korea uh, nuclear crisis that emerged right after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, so it is the, 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 the harmony um, uh, and that continued and continued until the, um, the 2008 global financial crisis. It is a turning point in two steps. First is that the global financial crisis and then the second step is that of course, uh, you look at uh, it is the, the uh, manufacturing purchasing manager index that I think is a better gauge of the ups and downs of the Chinese economy than GDP because the PMI is compiled by by both the Chinese government separately and by it used to be HSBC but now Chaixin so you have a private source and the public source you can uh, uh, cross-track the two 
to make sure that uh, they, they are reliable and they have a service uh, PMI as well that follow the same similar pattern. So you, and, and 50, um, the line of 50 is a kind of a stagnation line that above 50 is expansion, below 50 is uh, contraction. So it is manufacturing. So you look at the 2008, there's a big tank in the economy. Um, and then China, of course, we are very familiar with the story now that roll out the stimulus uh, to ask the state bank to, to lend money to all these uh, state enterprise and local government to build high-speed road, little airport, little subway line, and everything you can think of uh, to build and coal plant, coal power plant, steel mill, uh, all kinds of factories and real estate project and things like that. So the economy rebounds very impassively uh, uh, in 2009 and 2010. Uh, but now that, um, uh, of course, that we, we, we all know that, and, and uh, uh, as uh, your colleagues at UCSD, Victor Shi is an uh, expert in this field, is that the, the debt problem, uh, that is the, is the kind of a side effect of this stimulus, is that a lot of enterprise and uh, local government in China is indebted. And, um, and then the economy starts to slow down after 2010, when, when the effect of the monetary stimulus or financial stimulus uh, taper off, and then you can see that uh, the yellow line is the kind of a new loans, uh, by, uh, mostly by state bank, um, uh, but later on that uh, some kind of a P2P and other kind of a lending institution in China also involved. You see that that uh, the big spike is in, in lending is, is the stimulus, uh, but later on that you see, can see the pattern whenever the economy tank too much, uh, the government turn on the floodgate again and then there's a spike um, in lending, and then it create a kind of a, a rebound of the economy, uh, but less impassive than the, the post-stimulus uh, big rebound in 2009, 2010. So the pattern is that the Chinese economy is indebted, uh, its energy uh, dissipated, uh, this uh, expansion of the manufacturing hovering around the stagnation line, um, and, and this big dip is the COVID, uh, definitely, and then now it rebounds. Uh, but the rebound is less impassive than the post-2008 uh, financial crisis rebound. And each time they lead the heavier dose of, uh, of lending to create a lesser, um, uh, less, less impressive rebounds every time. So it's almost like an addiction, uh, addiction that, that every, after you're addicted, you lead the strongest dose to have a, a weaker stimulus effect, but you cannot just take it off. So China is in this situation that the economy is slowing down to significantly and, uh, and World Bank recently has a new paper that summarizes all the finding about this kind of a declining productivity growth uh, uh, given by the mis uh, misallocation of capital provided with the state bank driven lending, but it is another story. But the, 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 the undoubtable situation is that China economy has slowed down. And, and uh, the indebtedness is a real problem that, uh, so the, the, the Chinese economy ever since the late last years of Hu Jintao and then the Xi Jinping era is struggling to take care of this, try to find a new mo locomotive or new source of growth of the Chinese economy. So it is the fading of the China boom that, that uh, late Hu Jintao administration and the Xi Jinping administration has been struggling with. And, and they have different solutions, of course. One solution is the, the technological upgrading then I don't have time to get into that, but actually it is not quite impressive. There's a lot of talk and a lot of research and talking about, oh, China has already become, has become a high tech um, giant, but actually you look at the pet, but people look at it by just counting the absolute number of patent coming out from China and seeing there's a big rise, but actually it's CSIS and also Bloomberg uh, research on this patent, uh, find that most of these patents are not quite useful because uh, if you have a patent then you register in the Chinese authority, you. Uh, you need to pay a fees to keep the patent, but they find that actually that uh, more than 90% of the patent is not renewed within five years, meaning that it is not commercially viable, that don't, people don't think that it's worth uh, the registration fee to continue keeping the patent. So many of these patents are not quite useful commercially. And in terms of the balance of payment of intellectual property, so actually World Bank has this data that uh, they have the data about how much a country pay for foreign patent in, in their production, domestic production, and how much money that other countries pay for your patents uh, to use your patent in their production. So uh, subtract the two number, you get a balance of balance uh, of payment of intellectual property as a kind of indication whether you are the let uh, intellectual property exporter or let intellectual property importer. And then you let, can see that US is uh, running a huge service in patent, uh, intellectual property. Uh, it also includes copyright and other things, but mostly the patent payment. 
Uh, and Japan and Germany, they are also surplus country, meaning that they export more intellectual property than they use other countries' intellectual property. And, and South Korea is, is kind of deficit, but not very much, but you can see that the China line is really a deficit and the deficit is increasing meaning that you produce stuff in China that the Chinese uh, industry, industrial system um, um, use a lot of foreign patents that need to pay foreign, uh, 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 foreign government and foreign company for the patent fee. Uh, so China is not yet a kind of a, a technologically self-sufficient country, let alone a technological uh, exporting country. So in terms of technological upgrading, and of course that uh, there's a, a recent uh, report by CSIAS by my former colleagues in Indiana, that's uh, Scott Kennedy, who researched on the Chinese aerospace uh, industry with the C919 plane and finding that actually China pours so much money into building a kind of a, a, a national airplane, but actually that uh, the report find that all, most, if not all, of the components that make the plane fly uh, actually the import from the U.S. or Europe. So, the, so even if they make the plane, that that it is uh, look like a domestic plane, but actually it's based on foreign technology. So, so it didn't go as well as 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 it ever it was advertised. So, in this kind of technological upgrading route of uh, rejuvenating the economy and finding a little growth locomotive is is not going anywhere anytime soon. So, the the other um, um, the other the other route to to rejuvenate the economy is to become uh, 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 more aggressive on foreign companies. Actually, that uh, um, and you see that uh, I will show it uh, to you in in a minute. That that, that a lot of um, um, so it is a pie that is shrinking or growing not as fast as before. And the result is that a lot of state enterprise uh, with protection of uh, state authorities, regulatory authorities are starting to, to, to squeeze their foreign company partners uh, uh, in terms of intellectual property, uh, uh, intellectual property right infringement, uh, uh, technology transfer and, and so-called unfair competition as they complain, as the foreign company complain about it. So you see a lot of uh, little complaint from US corporations that I don't have time to uh, uh, look at this case, for example, but I can, can talk about at and because at and was the early, um, early, it is very important corporation to lobby on China behalf in the 1990s for this human right conditionality thing. But uh, in 95 and 96, uh, trying to pass a law that to actually basically uh, restrict foreign firms getting into China telecommunication business. And then of course, trying to throw a lot of resource to, to develop its own national champions, telecommunication company in China Mobile, China Telecom, uh, and basically to, to give them monopoly of China telecommunication uh, market. And now AT&T is just a nominal presence and I don't think it is even operating much in China. And because the China telecommunication market is uh, monopolized by state, giant that cultivated by the Chinese government. And there's a, a lot of other, other uh, examples. For example, Caterpillar is another example, which is an interesting, interesting example. It is a very public knowledge that Caterpillar is also uh, originally quite a keen uh, supporter of Chinese uh, uh, or China friendly policy. And they are on record lobbying uh, against bills that is not friendly with China over the years. Um, because uh, Caterpillar has joint ventured in, in Guangzhou and later, later in the China Lough West to produce and pa pair up with Chinese uh, state-owned company, uh, machine making company to, to create this kind of construction machine. And it's a huge market in China because there's a lot of construction going on. So Caterpillar has a big business, but later on, uh, Caterpillar start to run into trouble in China in, uh, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. And more importantly, then it start to find itself in a uh, less competitive position in the Chinese market when Chinese construction site stopped buying Caterpillar product, but buying some uh, would say that it's a copycat cop product from, uh, from Chinese uh, state-owned uh, machine construction machine makers. Uh, so Caterpillar got squeezed out from the Chinese market, not, not, uh, not totally, but, but uh, the market share definitely dropped uh, being outcompeted by, by its uh, competitor um, uh, with uh, state support. Uh, in all kinds uh, in, in Chinese government by Chinese government. So that uh, so there's a lot of squeezing of uh, foreign companies, uh, including definitely the US company. So it is why in 2011, that is the, the, the first time uh, after Hu Jintao visit Obama in the White House at John Pass conference, who basically uh, Obama 
set it to the public at the phase in the phase of who that uh, telling who that our corporation has a problem in 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 China that there's a lot of level playing field. It is not fair. The regulators are uh, enforcing regulation unfairly, targeting our companies, and there's also a theft of intellectual property of our companies. So. So behind the door, there is already lobbying going on uh, 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 before 2011. But 2011, January is the first time that Obama pointed out the problem in public about this kind of uh, U.S. corporation issues in, in, in Chinese market. And of course, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has this China Business Climate Survey uh, data that I have been keeping track of this data. And it always showing that it is uh, 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 this feeling that this U.S. corporation and all, also other corporations as well. I, I, I have similar kind of findings regarding the European corporations uh, in a different extent to a different extent, but they are, they are feeling unwelcome, they are squeezed, they are treated unfairly. So it is the um, situation that U.S. corporation that used to uh, have a good time in China start to be squeezed. Uh, so it's no wonder that they uh, become less enthusiastic in lobbying on China behalf in Congress and in all level of government for China friendly policy and to lobby against uh, uh, policy that is hostile to China. At the same time, that some of them even start to lobby for policies uh, that is um, uh, uh, not so friendly to China because uh, the, the Congress has the database about this firm lobbying regarding all kind of issues. Uh, and then you see some firms that used to lobby against the bill that accused China of currency manipulation in the early 2000s start to uh, shift their position to, to start to lobby in support of the legislation uh, that accused China for currency manipulation. So it is a change of timing in, in the U.S. corporation. And uh, so I'm just, uh, I don't have time to go into detail in each of it, but uh, you can see this kind of uh, not exactly a decoupling, but the cool down of U.S. corporation exposure to China and interest in China actually uh, uh, start to uh, uh, get a momentum after the global financial crisis, particularly after the uh, China rebounds in 2009, 2010. And you look at the Congress lobbying, uh, corporate, corporate lobbying in Congress that uh, there's a two different issues. One is the complaint about market access that uh, U.S. corporation lobbying Congress uh, to complain about uh, market access in China and then want Congress to do something uh, or the government to do something. And the other is the intellectual property right issues that want Congress to do something. So you see, and, and the green line is a combined one. You see that that is a, a spike. Um, uh, it is, has been rising and it reached the height uh, uh, and then came down a little bit, but actually uh, may stay at the high level after 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, and then I look at the court cases that uh, US companies uh, trying to sue Chinese company mostly for intellectual property uh, right infringement uh, of Chinese company in US courts. Uh, it is a database in US court and also uh, uh, drum up uh, uh, after 2008, 2009. Uh, so all indicators showing that the US corporation has already turned sour in terms of their relation in China. So, uh, so their lobby, lobbying activities shift uh, uh, radically uh, from early on in the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, so I'm wrapping up now. Um, and the more important is that uh, uh, the Chinese corporation competition with US corporation is now no longer only in Chinese market, but in overseas market because of the, the Bell and Road. Um, and um, I have this graph. Uh, oh, no, actually, no. Uh, I cut all this graph accidentally, but uh, actually you, you can, um, uh, actually it's not here, but, but I can tell you what it is. It is this um, uh, Chinese machine making companies. Uh, they, uh, they benefit a lot from the stimulus because a lot of order for the construction machine, there are three big ones, Sani and uh, uh, Sugong. Um, and Zhonglian and the three big construction makers, uh, construction machine maker in China. And the revenue growth actually tanked uh, after 2010, 2011, uh, because of the stimulus and the construction taper off. And then it rose again after 2013 because of Bell and Road. And then in the company report that I look at, they explicitly talk about the fact that we now low nowadays no longer have a lot of orders in, 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 in China because the high speed rail has been complete and all kind of thing that can be built with a profit, profitable margin all complete. 
So there's just a lot enough order in 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 China. But now most of their order come from Kazakhstan, come from uh, Pakistan, and come from, from come from Sri Lanka, and all these barren more countries. So this barren role is uh, to some extent. Uh, uh, has been benefiting this uh, state-owned enterprise in China uh, a lot because um, this parent role mostly is about Chinese government directly or through this AIIB and multilateral institution set up by China to lend money to these developing countries. And as an S CSIS report showed that uh, more than 80% um, uh, of the project in these countries financed by China alone, uh, 80%, more than 80% of this uh, uh, project hire a Chinese company or buy a Chinese uh, materials as, as opposed to uh, the World Bank funded project in which the uh, majority of the contractors are from the local economy. But in the China funded projects that uh, the contractors uh, of this project funded by Chinese lending that they hire Chinese company and buy Chinese materials and Chinese um, uh, 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 products uh, steel and 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 uh, construction machines, so on and so forth. So uh, you can see this uh, uh, aggressive export of capital and ex export of goods uh, and surface capacity to the barren world country, and you can uh, see that it is reflected in the lobbying activities. For example, Caterpillar, again, that once lobbying hard for the for Ob the, the Obama administration to speed up this free trade deal with Caribbean, with uh, with Asia, and with all other countries, they explicitly say that. Without this free trade deal, we are out competing in those markets uh, by the Chinese uh, construction machine maker. Uh, so the US need to have free trade deal with this country so that we can uh, have a more competitive footing to compete with the Chinese company. So you see that uh, the, the US corporation not only squeezed by the Chinese corporation in Chinese market after 2010 or so, but with the in expansion of the barren roads and, and the Chinese landing in in the developing world, they are also squeezed and outcompeted in many ways uh, by Chinese corporations. So they are in a dire situation in this kind of a global stage of uh, intercapitalist competition. So the, the conclusion uh, is more complicated than it sounds. But uh, what I want to tell the story is that this it, it is really this corporation shift of sentiments regarding China. That of course there's still some corporation making money in China. They will still lobby for China. For example, more recently that there's a bill in Congress talking about uh, restricting uh, uh, goods made in China in forced labor camp in Xinjiang, for example, to be imported in the U.S. So you you reportedly Coca-Cola and Apple uh, lobbying against the bill. Uh, but it is more exception now that the, nowadays that you see this try the U.S. Uh, law that is uh, of, uh, uh, hurting China national interests from a China point of view and benefiting, for example, Taiwan or, or, or Hong Kong. And in old days, in the 1990s, when you have this kind of bills that U.S. corporations will lobby against it hard, and then it is never had a good chance to get to the floor to be voted uh, or, or, or to be passed. And many of these bills will get killed by this kind of business lobbying back in the old days. But nowadays, and you see a lot of these bills are passed uh, unanimously on a high, uh, high, high approval rate, uh, high uh, approval rate. Uh, so this has something to do with the, the shifting corporate lobbying uh, in, the, in, in the US uh, regarding China related policy and bills. Uh, and it in turn has something to do with, with this uh, US corporation to, to changing sentiment uh, to China. We, we see that Germany and, and a lot of European corporations is starting, starting to, to, to feel the same uh, regarding China. So it is the underlying uh, uh, economic and business origins, I would say, of this uh, changing U.S.-China relation and 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 increasingly also changing Euro, uh, Europe-China uh, relations. So I try to contribute to this debate about how this deterioration come and and how it is going to lead to from the perspective of corporate lobbying. I have more to say in historical comparison, but I run out of time. I know, so uh, probably uh, if there's a chance, I would like to to, to go to that in the Q and A. But thank you for your patience and and and. I look forward to your questions and comments. Well, thank you very much for a very provocative talk. Um, you've given us all a lot to consider. Um, in the interest of time, because we only have 15 minutes left, um, I'm just rather than going to take 10 minutes uh, as we originally scheduled, I'll just ask one and I'll save some of my questions for tomorrow. Uh, for those people unfamiliar with how to ask a question, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, of your Zoom screen, and then type in your question and it'll appear to me on my screen. 
Let's see, out of all the questions that I have uh, up here, I'm trying to resist channeling my inner Victor Schur and asking you about your evidence in your database. I won't ask you about that as my only question. Instead, I'll ask you about, in your, in your analysis, uh, you wrote that you expect Biden to follow the Obama model and work with carrots along the lines of TPP, those are pretty bitter yeah. carrots, uh, rather yeah. than Trump style sticks of tariffs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What would China going for those carrots look like? What sort of policies uh, do you think would work? If for instance, China did more to liberalize its financial markets and allowed hedge fund managers like my brother in London to manage the private wealth of people in China, would that work? Uh, if they allowed more uh, 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 allowed foreign companies to participate in the Made in China 2025 plan uh, to get yeah. state contracts with that work. And I guess all of this is an indirect way of saying, what are the possibilities for creating new interest groups in the U.S.? Yes, yes. There's, uh, to, to make the, there's, I can have a long answer, but to make my long answer short, then we can have more time to talk tomorrow that uh, China can definitely uh, adapt to lure back the, the US corporations and things like that and then become more liberals uh, or free in terms of this market and welcome. But there's a structural con constraint. It is, after all, the Chinese business has their own interest. Their interest, of course, is a lot monopoly and not to have a foreign company to compete too much. Uh, so a lot of things that China say that they would do, for example, re more recently, that when, when people are speculating or lobbying or trying to persuade Biden administration to go back to the TPP, which is now the CPTPP now without the US, uh, Xi Jinping recently said that, oh, actually China is also interested uh, because then China recently has this RCEP and other trade pact, but that trade pact is more more firework than, 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 than real things because uh, that uh, I have an article in the people that talk about it, but the, the, the the Chinas say that they want to go to CPTPP, but the CPTPP, even without the US, is now set up in a way as it was uh, back in the Obama administration to uh, create all this groundwork uh, to make sure that when China want to join, China need to do a lot of painful reform to meet the standards. And, and the existing CPTPP, even without the US, has a lot of um, the causes about state-owned enterprise. Uh, so, so it's restricting the participation of the monopolies of uh, state-owned enterprise. So, if China really want to join, in good faith and really follow the course and rule, that it really lead to the, the forfeit its monopoly, the, the state-owned enterprise monopoly in a lot of sectors. That I don't think Chinese uh, elite and the Chinese state-owned enterprise in the best interests uh, are really ready to do it. They might say that they are going to abide by the rule, but actually they don't. But uh, with uh, more than 20 years of the WTO, that now is a lot of campaign about China is still a lot happy, a lot ready to open the financial sectors. This is another thing that even turns some uh, Wall Street firms, uh, of course, that, uh, that, that uh, one of the, the question in the chat box say that someone, uh, Chinese uh, uh, professor or scholar saying that they have a lot of friends in US and Wall Street Journal has the article saying that actually the, the China last friends in the US is the Wall Street, but even Wall Street firms are not very patient uh, with, with, with China because of the, uh, the closeness of the financial market that it uh, promised to open up when it joined the WTO after certain years, but it's now it's still closed. And in Hong Kong, is in my other books that uh, then they have this alternative is using Hong Kong as a place to do the financial dealing with uh, Chinese uh, elite and Chinese enterprise. But even that in Hong Kong situation is that the Chinese uh, state-owned banks are ex expanding very aggressively and the US bank has been squeezed out from Hong Kong uh, in the last five years or so. Uh, so they, they, feel the, they feel the pain and, and of this being squeezed out from, from the Chinese market. So, uh, Provided with the vested interest, huge vested interest of the Chinese corporation to stay this way, then I'm not optimistic that it is not at least very easy. It's not easy at all for China to 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 change the way to 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 counteract this kind of a U.S. multilateral approach if it is really to take off under Biden. Yeah. Um... Wow, there's lots of potential follow-ups. I didn't realize you could see the Q&A and start answering them for yourself. I see you saw Victor's question about whether a Wall Street desire for a piece of the Chinese uh, tech action was enough. I, I understood your answer to be not with the way those companies go private. Is that what, is, did I understand you correctly? That they, they, they need to give up a lot of monopoly because there's a lot of rule that restrict, for example, in telecommunication market, they have, uh, they have still the, out of national uh, security reason or, or all other reasons that they, they, they have restriction of foreign telecommunication company to running, to providing service, uh, for example. So that the Chinese telecommunication companies has a monopoly of things. So 
if really China really want to join, for example, CPTPP and, and all other kind of uh, trade deals with uh, other countries and, and US or Europe, whatever, they, that I'm, I'm sure that the telecommunication companies and whatever countries that want to try, sign this deal with China will, will pressure China to open up, not only in telecommunication, but in all other sectors. But again, that because of the vested interests, that it will be very difficult for China to do so. Do you think the right, uh, the right kind of American interest, in other words, they don't have to be as numerous as manufacturers, but maybe as powerful as Wall Street, uh, if, they ha if, they, if they won over surgically the way you described Beijing as having operated in 90, uh, 1993, 94, uh, if they operated equally surgically to win over Wall Street, uh, yeah. do you think that, that would, it would be okay that, they, uh, that the uh, US threw Caterpillar under the bus, as it were? that they need to provide enough incentive for them. But uh, now one of the biggest uh, business of uh, Wall Street banks with uh, China definitely is this kind of IPOs that's mostly happening in Hong Kong. As I said, and I have a separate database for, for my Hong Kong book is that, that you look at the IPO market in Hong Kong that the Chinese state banks are actually expanding and squeezing out the American bank who used to do underwriting for, for, for Chinese IPO that, uh, so that they need to provide enough incentive. And the, the biggest prize that many Wall Street firms is eyeing, and that is why in the Obama administration, actually they are talking about signing a Beijing-Washington bilateral, bilateral investment treaty. Uh, so that US will be more open to Chinese investment and China will be more in, open to US investment, particularly in finance. And there's some people in the US uh, Chinese financial sector that want to have liberalization reform in the financial sector and net foreign banks to have a more dominant role to play in the Chinese uh, financial market to compete with state banks. But again, that it is a faction of the financial elite that, that would say that, uh, that is what they want. But after all that the CCP uh, control of the economy and the society, large part is this control of credit. Uh, that local government companies still lead to look up to the, 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 uh, the party state for credit and financial resources. So it's the last thing I would see that uh, the party state will, will, will let go, that it will be dangerous uh, from the perspective to, to let all these foreign banks to freely operate to compete with the state bank and lose control. And also for uh, so-called financial security that they learn from the uh, Asian financial crisis that to, to liberalize the, the capital account and to let the foreign banks come in and let money come in and go out uh, freely. Uh, it's dangerous, uh, it will create financial instability. So I think that is a big mental, theoretical and vested interest hurdle for China to really do something that uh, make this, uh, create enough incentive for even financial firms to, to become a big uh, champions of China interests in the US and in other Western countries. I'm gonna to shift to one of the earlier questions uh, about uh, fatigue among um, foreign investors in the US in particular with uh, China's uh, fulfilling its WTO, WTO obligations. And also use that as a way of asking you about what are the other explanations? Mm -hmm. How, what other explanations did you have to dismiss to get to your explanation? Is it possible it's as simple as that person proposes, and namely that people just got fed up with um, waiting for China to adhere to its WTO obligations? That is, that is, of course, that that is very much reflected in this kind of uh, both Europe and US uh, don't want to certify China as a kind of a market economy, and then and then so. The, uh, it is fed up, uh, it is frustration, and, uh, and how you deal with this frustration has, again, that two different strategies, that uh, the Obama and probably Biden strategy and, and, uh, and the Trump strategy, that the, the Obama strategy is that I look, you look at the WTO lawsuit, uh, US against China, actually in Obama administration, it sued up. Uh, 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 in just W. Bush administration, it, it didn't happen at all. Uh, very badly, but in in the Obama administration is really Obama administration really try to uh, force China to change things by suing in the WTO and and US actually won most of those cases. Uh, of course, then then the question is then enforcement whether it is it is it is really sufficiently enforced. It. And then the Trump administration came in and adopted another opposed and and saying that WTO is useless, toothless, and then we, we just uh, try to destroy it and then don't don't pay attention to it. We use this bilateral tariff as an alternative means to do it. And uh, and what Biden would do, and I'm I'm not sure that uh, maybe that he would go back to this increasing U.S. Uh, influence in the WTO because in WTO politics is has changed dramatically. That it used to be dominated by U.S. and Western country, but no more. Uh, China and Brazil and India and all these uh, 
in WTO, they have their G20 grouping of developing countries, including China and Brazil and, and South Africa and, and as a negotiation block. So in WTO, that uh, US uh, relative influence in, 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 this w, in this and other multilateral organization is declining, actually. That uh, how much US can do through the WTO uh, the same can be said regarding the UN Human Rights Commission and all other kind of multilateral organizations that China has been increasing their influence. So how U.S. can boost, boost up the, 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 the U.S. influence uh, with an alliance of other like-minded countries, so to speak, uh, in this multilateral uh, organization will be also a challenge. Uh, so many more questions to answer in so little time. Um, let me ask Lake Wong's question. Um, what do you think about the convergence of interest when it comes to U.S.-China relations between the private sector and the state sector in China? I think that there's a lot of convergence in interest in China private sectors and 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 and, and U.S. and other countries because the, they have this uh, common problem of unfair um, enforcement of regulation by the state regulatory bodies that favoring state enterprises and of course that uh, the Guoji Min Tui that is advance of the state enterprise and 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 the retreat of the private enterprise uh, started uh, in the Hu Jintao era and then escalated in the in the Xi Jinping era then you can see that that uh, recently there's a huge attack on private enterprise not only in, in uh, 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 prosecuting or even sometimes arresting some uh, uh, private enterprise uh, 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 CEOs or, or owner, and and um, and re more recently, of course, even 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 uh, Jack Ma, that it is well connected uh, private entrepreneurs that you have this kind of uh, end finance group uh, uh, debacle that that they they pull out, they they cancel his. Uh, uh, big IPO in mainland China in Hong Kong and last minute, so they don't care about the reputation and, and all the fallout, but just to show the private entrepreneurs as big as well connected politically uh, as Jack Ma, that who is the boss. So definitely that they, they, they these private entrepreneurs need to be uh, very careful politically that they don't want to be seen as a kind of a traitors to collaborating with foreign evil forces and things like that. But definitely there's a convergence of interest among these uh, private enterprises. And after all that, uh, all this discussion about productivity slowdown has something to do with this Guo Jin Min Tui, that is this uh, advance of the state enterprise because the state enterprise got a lot of resources, but they are not very productive. Uh, so they have uh, followed the kind of involutionary growth. They throw in more and more inputs to get more and more output, but the productivity is not very high. Profitability is not very high. And, and private sectors, uh, particularly the small and medium uh, enterprises, uh, they create a lot of jobs. So they're job creators, but at the same time, they are also uh, still a source of uh, productivity growth and profitability growth. So, so definitely there's an inherent convergence in interest in, in terms of these private sectors and, and the overall health of Chinese economy of the US. But at the time being, that while the state-owned enterprises, uh, because of this path dependence and political connections, then and, and uh, that they are still dominating, that it is uh, very hard to to, to make this convergence um, of interest overwhelm this kind of uh, uh, turtles of, of monopoly of state enterprise that hurt both uh, domestic private enterprise and, and, uh, and, and uh, foreign corporations. Well, uh, we have uh, only 60 seconds left. So uh, I guess I should uh, either uh, leave it for tomorrow to ask you about the evidence. Um, and what, what your databases are filled with, but maybe um, if you could give Tom Gold a, a thumbs up or thumbs down, is India in any shape to compete effectively with China in attracting foreign capital, opening markets and so on? Do you see them as a potential rival? Would you repeat again that- uh, Oh, uh, it's Tom Gold's question. Is India, yeah. in, is India in any shape oh, yeah. to compete effectively with China? Yeah, the Indian, that's an that's interesting question that I always want to do an India-China comparison. Uh, India is, uh, is a big consumption market and, and uh, it is the, the wage level is still low that of course that India has the, its own hurdle to, 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 um, to overcome. That is the, the literacy rate of, uh, of the workers is lower than China. And then there's a lot of regulatory hurdles uh, and different states have different regulation about foreign investment and things like that. And then they, they are not exactly uh, open more or more open than China to foreign investment. Though it seems to be, for example, Foxconn uh, would be interested in, in moving some of this uh, assembly line and many other countries to India. But uh, in the end, that many of them actually pick Vietnam and Vietnam is an interesting 
comparison because in terms of the, the human capitals of the labors and and uh, and the, the like literacy rate and health of the, the labor because of the collective uh, agriculture and the social legacy is very more comparable to China and Vietnam right now uh, is uh, on a terrible drive to attract foreign investment. It's more open to foreign investment. So in comparison to India, India has advantage of size, but it is fragmented in different states. Different states has different regulations and different uh, issues. And of course, India is a democratic country. So that is uh, from an investor point of view and they have unions and labor movement and things like that. It is, it is a kind of a disadvantage from an investor perspective. And, and Vietnam is more like China like 20 years ago in like Guangdong, but China, Vietnam doesn't have the size advantage. So uh, it is a problem that if the, because the companies want to diversify from China, that where do they go to that they probably they won't go to one particular country like India maybe. To a couple of countries, Costa Rica and Dominican Republic, and and Vietnam and India, Bangladesh, and and then to diversify. It. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much for a very stimulating hour, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to conduct an interview with Professor Hong uh, tomorrow, and uh, we'll also have this up on our website later. So thank you once again, and see you all soon. Thanks for all the questions. Hopefully, I can answer some of the questions tomorrow in the in the interview. Bye bye. Uh, bye.